Hebrews chapter number 11. Verse number 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder, rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, three components of this verse. I mean, we could read all of chapter number 11. Examples of great faith throughout the Bible. Most of them. Examples of faith when they didn't have the person of the Holy Ghost indwelling them. Yet they were Old Testament saints. The Holy Ghost hadn't yet been given unto the believers. They had to be saved in order to receive the Holy Ghost. What did they have? They had God's Word and that was it. Most of them not even the completed Old Testament, let alone the entire Word of God which we have. But yet, through it all, they had great faith. They could be said about them that they believed God, and that was enough. Right? Well, why are they the example? Because today, if you believe God, that's still enough. But the three components to verse number 6, we know that without faith, it is impossible to please God. I've, it's been a while since I've made the joke. But a long time ago, the teens used to make jokes that if I asked a question, if they didn't know it, they'd just guess faith. Because chance was, you know, faith is pretty important. I said, it's important. may not be the most important thing, but it's pretty important if without faith, you can't please God. So I can't make the argument that faith is the most important thing, but it was by, or by grace are you saved through faith. It was a part of your salvation. Your faith was so important that God didn't, you know, leave it up to you to find your own faith. God gave unto every man a measure of faith. It was so important that God wanted to make sure you had the right amount of faith that it took in order to be saved. Faith pretty important. It's the first thing we learn in verse number 6. But then it says, For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. So we know without faith, it's impossible to please him. But when you come, you do have to use that faith to believe that he is. Well, that he is what? That he is exactly what you need. Regardless of what the situation is, you have to believe that one, God does exist, and two, he's what you need. I mean, it is kind of silly. You know, go out and pray to something that you don't believe is real. Right? Some people don't know what they believe in. Well, that's a pretty pitiful state to be in. I mean, I know that my God is the Alpha and Omega. I believe that He is. I mean, He even said, I am that I am. I believe that He is that He is. You must believe that He is and, third part, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Third component, you don't just have to believe that he exists, but that he will honor those that diligently seek him out. It says that he rewards them. I mean, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's God's law, not man's law. God said, whatever you sow, you will reap. But I believe that if we diligently seek Him out, He will reward our efforts with fruit. Well, what's that fruit? Himself. If God believed that He is, and believe that if we diligently seek, He will reward those that seek Him. Now notice, end of verse number 6 a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Not things. Not people. Not position. What are those people diligently seeking out? God. I don't believe that God's going to reward somebody that seeks after Him for their own merit or their own glory. I don't believe that God will reward someone that doesn't diligently seek Him but just seeks. Don't believe that God will reward those that half-heartedly seek Him. 
don't believe that God's going to reward anybody that's seeking after Mary. Don't believe that God's going to reward anybody that's seeking after a preacher. I believe that God rewards those that diligently seek Him. Well, as we're reading this, well, not as we, as I was reading this, you know those times when you know what a word means, Brother Mike, but then somebody says, well, what's it mean? I'm like, well, it means what it means. I know what it means, but I can't tell you what it means. That's why I was with, di I know what diligently means. But what does diligently actually mean? If I were to you know, explain it to somebody else, it means to put great effort. Usually, diligently means to put great effort towards a goal. Okay, but the one definition that really sums it up is perpetual effort towards a goal. Consistently or constantly seeking after something. That's what diligently means. Well, let's put it into practical application. Okay, Abraham. Abram, then Abraham. I mean, this chapter tells us that Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. He was diligently seeking after the place that God himself built and established and set aside just for people that believed in God to live in. Well, Abraham found it one day. He got the glory. But one day he'll see the finished work, which is what? New heaven, new earth. Right, we get over to the end of Revelation. That's the city that he was desiring. But see, he diligently sought it. But how do you know that? One, he believed that God was God. Two, he believed that God was able to do everything that he promised unto Abram, or then Abraham. And then he believed God so much that he left his home, right, got up from where he was born, everybody that he knew, and he went off. But where did he go? He went looking after God. For the rest of his life, he never settled down and set up a new city where he says, this is my new home. No, he was a nomad the rest of his life, looking for the place that God built. It was perfect. One day he found it. But along the way, Abraham may have stopped for a day. Does that mean he wasn't diligently seeking? Well, no, sometimes animals need to be watered. Sometimes animals need rest. Sometimes I need to sit down, rest for a while. Maybe need to go hunting for a little bit. Come back, dress the food, prepare it so that we can take it with us. Does that mean that he wasn't seeking after the city that you know, God built, made it. No, it doesn't mean that it wasn't diligently seeking. Diligent means constant seeking. You think all the while that he was hunting or dressing some fish that he may have caught out of the river or while they were there repairing or making do tools, equipment, he wasn't looking around thinking, you know what? I believe that that hill is just a little bit more, you know, perfect than the hill that we went over. I think God might be over that hill. He was always seeking. He was always asking. Hey, y'all see a city that's not like any other city around here? Well, what's it look like? I don't know, but God made it. See, constant effort. Constant seeking doesn't mean that you're always walking around with, you know, binoculars. Seeing what you can see. See, I believe that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Pray without ceasing. Does that mean we're supposed to pray every second of every day? No, but it means that we're supposed to have the avenue of communication and prayer with God open at all times. Prayer is a two-way street. That's how I talk to God, but where does God talk to me? Through the Word. Part of praying is listening. Pray without ceasing means I have to roll over my cares upon Him so that I am unhindered to go out and live the life that He wants me to live. But all the while, I've got to be listening. 
If I'm not praying, does that mean that I don't care about the things that I've already prayed to God about? No. That means I just believe that God can handle them better than I can. If we're not praying right now, does that believe that we don't? Does that mean that we don't believe that you know God's going to answer our prayers? No, I believe that He heard it the first time. Doesn't mean that I'm not diligently caring about those situations that I've already prayed to God about. Well, same thing. If you wanted to go out and dig for oil, right? If you didn't have a shovel in the ground every second of every day, does that mean that you're not trying to find it? But oh, they got to do surveys. They got to build, you know, dig them test pilot holes. Then once they find something that looks promising, then they break out the big excavators and they go to town drilling. Does that mean that if the big drills aren't on the property, they're not looking for it? No. Diligent is not a measure of how much effort you put into it. It is a requirement. Diligent means that effort must be consistent, constantly exerted. I mean, let's be honest. Some days you can't seek as hard as you sought yesterday. Tomorrow you may be able to seek harder than you did today. What's that? That's called the ebb and flow. We got flesh. This thing gets tired. I mean, you spend all day fasting. Guess what? Tomorrow you're going to be more hungry than you were today. Doesn't mean that tomorrow you're going to be able to fast as much as you did before. You can read as much as you want to in a day. But quality over quantity. Did you really seek the Lord in one verse and devote as much time as you could to it? Or did you try and read as much as you could hoping that something would jump off the page at you? Did you spend the time in prayer beforehand making your petition known to God believing that when you got in here He'd reward your effort over there with rewarding your seeking? There's, there's no stand If you put this much effort in, God will reward you. That's not the case. What's he say? He says, I reward those that diligently seek me. What's that mean? You may have to work so many hours in the day, but you still seek God on the job. You may have to sleep throughout the day. Yeah, well, not throughout the day, but at some point in the day. You may have to sleep, but it doesn't mean that while you're awake, all you're focused on is the rest of your... No, no, no. Constantly. Lord, what do you want me to do? Well, if you're constantly seeking out that answer, you're going to find it. But if it's intermittent, well, I just don't have time to do that today. You're not going to be rewarded. Because He rewards those that diligently... Diligent means constant means that you care enough about it that it becomes a part of your life. Let's look at three examples in the life of Jesus. First one, blind Bartimaeus. What blind Bartimaeus? Well, he was blind. We know he was blind. We know he was a beggar. He didn't have the capability to go out and work on his own. He relied upon God's grace and the charity of others that he would be able to eat for the day. But what do we know about blind Bartimaeus? Well, first off, we know that blind Bartimaeus believed. Without faith, it's impossible to believe him. But what did he believe? Well, we do know that first, he believed in God. But then, we also know he believed in the Son. At some point, blind Bartimaeus heard about Jesus. And as Bartimaeus was sitting there on the side of the road in his beggar's garment, right, just praying that God would send somebody by his way that had what he needed in order to live for another day, somebody said, Bartimaeus, I don't have any extra today. But I did hear about a guy that could help you. His name is Jesus. Well, Bartimaeus remembered what was said about Jesus. 
I believe from that point on, he wasn't really as concerned about the food or the money that he would receive throughout that. Everybody that came by, he's asking, hey, anybody got news about Jesus? Anybody know where Jesus is at today? Last I heard, he was over on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Is he, he make his way over here yet? Well, why, why do I believe that? Because as soon as he heard that Jesus was around, he had already taken to heart that Jesus was the only one that could help him. But keep in mind, he's blind. He may have been able to got, you know, stand up and stumble around, but he either needed somebody to lead him to Jesus, which on that day, go study it out, they were trying to shut him up. You think if you're telling somebody to shut up that you're also in the same breath going to offer to take them to the one that they're shouting about? No, they were trying to get him as far away from Jesus as possible. He knew that he didn't have somebody to lead him to Jesus. But what did he believe? He believed that if Jesus heard him, that Jesus would come to him. Why? Because I know that first he cried. Then he cried the more, even louder. What did he believe? He believed that if Jesus heard him, that he would reward his faith. Well, requirements of the verse. He had faith. So therefore, it's possible to please God. They what? He believed that God was and that God's Son was. Both of them, that they existed and that they were able to do for Him what He couldn't do for Himself. And then what? I believe every day He was inquiring about Jesus. And then when He heard Jesus was near, He didn't even stop to ask, well, how far away is He? He just starts crying. Jesus! Then He calls Him Son of David. What's he saying? I believe that you're the one that God promised was going to be sent. And then Jesus rewarded his diligence. It's the diligent faith that God rewards. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. But if you have faith and it's not consistent, God can't reward that faith. Why? Because it's faith and then unbelief. Faith, unbelief. Faith, can't have one and then the other. You don't have either. I mean, didn't the Apostle Paul, how long halt you between two opinions? How long do you stand betwixt the two? Say, so make up your mind. Do you believe God or do you not believe God? But it's the faith that is diligent that was rewarded with blind body. If he just stopped crying when the crowd tried to shut him up, Jesus wouldn't have come. Did Jesus know where he was? Jesus knew exactly where Bartimaeus was. I believe Jesus walked by that way that day just for Bartimaeus. Jesus knew that they'd try and shut him up. But he also knew that if he had enough faith to cry even louder, guess what was going to happen? He's going to receive his sight that day. Well, second example. Let's look at the woman with the issue of blood. Well, did she have faith? Well, that's about all that she had left. See, she had spent 12 years going from doctor to doctor to physician to anybody that even had a homemade recipe for whatever this issue of blood that she had. She tried everything to where she lost everything going after the cure. Can't say that I really blame her. I mean, what would you do in order to fight for your right to live? I mean, if God gave me peace to get through it, I'd try just about anything. Unless He told me not to do it. But see, she had realized that life meant more to her than anything else in the world. Which, not a bad thing. Life is a gift of God. Why do you think we value the life of a child so much? Even the unborn. Because that's a gift. No, no man created that. That was God breathed. But, she valued life. She said, I believe that first she believed that there was a cure out there. Then she found out that there wasn't a cure. Then, 
she believed that she had exhausted all options. She thought, there's no way. I've tried everything. I'm going to die. There's no cure. There's no help for me. But then, just like Bartimaeus, one day she heard about Jesus. See, here's how much she believed that he could help her. She believed that he was, because she believed that he was real. Then she sought him out, and she believed that he was so much God that she didn't even need to bother him. All she had to do was touch the hem of his garment. And she believed that if I can just get close enough to God to touch his clothing, I believe that that could take care of me. She believed that she wasn't worth the time of the Savior. She didn't even want to distract him. She said, I know that he's got better things to do than to take care of me, but if I can just get close enough to him to touch his clothing, that'd be enough to take care of my problem. Now see, that's a lot of faith. Well, see, it was also diligent faith. Because not only did she seek him out, you study it out, there was a great crowd around that day. And can you imagine how hard it was for somebody that, what, what's it called nowadays? Is leukemia the cancer of the bone? Or is it the cancer of the blood? That's what I thought. Now imagine somebody today that had leukemia without any radiation, without any treatment. Had had it for about 12 years now. Can you imagine how sickly they were? Can you imagine how weak in the flesh this woman actually was? I mean, can you imagine how hard it was just for her to get up out of bed, in the morning, let alone push through a crowd that was all trying to get to Jesus? But yet she did it. She had to get there on her hands and her knees and her elbows. She eventually got to Jesus. That's how diligent this woman's faith was. And then she touched him, and the Bible says, straightway. What's that mean? As soon as she did it, what happened? God rewarded her diligent faith. Go study out all the times that Jesus would heal somebody, or that Jesus would make the, you know, the lame to walk. What does he always say? Thy faith hath made thee whole. He never rewarded their effort. In fact, even the man that was lowered down through the rooftop, right, and his four friends tore the roof off the place to get the lame man down and through the bed. When Jesus saw their faith, that's what was rewarded. She didn't have to ask God to heal her. She believed that he would. And God rewarded her faith. Not her act. They didn't honor her words. She didn't even talk to Jesus. After that, I can just, it says straightway, she's made whole. You know what I believe? She's just sitting there and she can feel the difference. She's stunned on the ground sitting there that what in the world just happened? Then Jesus is having a conversation over here. Who touched me? His disciples said, what are you talking about? You see how big this crowd is? Everybody's trying to touch you. He said, no, no, no. Virtue departed out of me. And they said, well, I didn't see anything shoot out of you. They're like, what are you talking about? Then he turns, you know, they all start looking. There's just this woman on the ground weeping, crying tears of joy. Saying, what in the world happened to you? They said, um, I think we found whoever touched you. Why? Because they haven't one of them, you know, fits that Brother Phil or you know, one of the other crazy people that we got around here just have a fit. She's trying to talk, nothing coming out but tears. Right then, they get the backstory. Jesus already knew the backstory, but the disciples get the backstory. What's that? She had an issue of blood for 12 years. She had spent everything that she owned. All she did was touch the hem of his garment. But what they find out that day? It wasn't that she touched Jesus. I'll never forget that message. I believe it was uh, 
could have been dead. I don't remember who preached it anymore. I just remember what they preached. But it was kissing the door of heaven and going to hell. What's that? He said, I am the door. The sheep got to go through the door to get to the Father's house. There's a lot of people that touched him, but it didn't touch them. Judas kissed him on the cheek, went out and hung himself, went out into hell for all of eternity. A lot of people that came near to him, but not many people had God touch their life. But what's the requirement? Diligent faith. You must diligently seek Him. Now, I mean, we can go into... They, we get like a half a verse where it says, you know, He went up into the synagogue and then they, they, it'll detail what happened in the synagogue that day, but then it'll say, and He healed all their sick. Well, what's that mean? Jesus did a lot of healing that day. We just get snippets of some of them. John said if everything that Jesus did in his earthly ministry was written down, the world could not contain it. Just the things that he did while he was here, that people saw. Well, what's recorded? Enough for us to have faith. Enough to prove that he was who God said he was in the Old Testament and that he fulfilled all the prophecies and promises of the Word so that he could become the sinless and perfect sacrifice. But see, I wonder how many of these people just knew what they had been taught. Again, they couldn't take this home with them. This was kept under lock and key at the synagogue with the priests and the scribes. Only few people were allowed to read out of it and study it. And the only time that people heard it was when they went to the house of God and had somebody get up, stay and read it, and then teach them about it. So I wonder how much they really knew. They knew enough. What was that? They believed that He was, and that He was a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Not rocket science. What to take? It takes Him, and it takes me getting to where He wants me to be. Because if you didn't believe that He wanted you to be somewhere else, why would you be here? I mean, if you thought that, well, I am where I need to be, then, well, hang on, I got that backwards. If He thought He wanted you to be somewhere else, why would you be here? And if you knew that He wanted you to be here, why would you go anywhere else? That's what I meant. But see, the devil generally said, you may know that this is where he wants you to be. There's a lot of people you go and find out. They didn't know Jesus was going to be there that day, but where were they? In the synagogue. On the Lord's day. They knew where to get a hold of God at. And it just so happened that God, instead of answering their prayer, walked in and changed their whole life. That he said, hey, I know that she's praying over there, but I'm over here. Come here. I heard your prayer. Let's reward your faith. But they didn't know that the one that spoke everything into existence was just going to walk through the front doors that day. But where did they go? They knew where to get the solution. But what's the diligent part? They kept going back. They didn't go once. Right, you go and study it out. After these people that Jesus healed, what do you always find? They went off telling the world, you're not going to believe what happened. Well, their faith was rewarded, but then they found out that there's something else that God wanted them to do. Which is what? Tell everybody. Go study out that madman of Gadara. They wanted to go with Jesus. Jesus said, no, you got to stay here. you got to tell these people what I did for you. Well, he believed that God could do something for him. Why? Because he went and told them. You find when Jesus come back, everybody come out to meet him. That madman who now was clothed in his right mind at the feet of Jesus, when he became discipled, guess what he believed? He believed that he may not be the one that can help him, but he believed that God could use him to help other people. Because if he didn't believe that, he wouldn't have told everybody. And he believed that if he went and told, that God could do the rest. But what did we find out? God did the rest. 
Everybody came out to see. Well, what happened? One person just believed that God could help all them people. Why? Because God had helped them. That wasn't nowhere in the note, but there you go. Third example that I wanted to look at. Okay, Syrophoenician woman. Here's this woman that, under the law, she was an outcast. She was a half-breed. She was unclean in the eyes of the law. She had no claim to God, had no right to God. She didn't have any business being around the things of God. But yet she comes. And this is what we find out about the Syrophoenician woman. We know that she believes in God. Why? Because she came to the Son of God and asked. Which tells us what? She believes that God can reward her. But she also believed that she wasn't worthy of it. Jesus called her a dog. Said it's not meat to cast the food for the children to the dogs. What'd she say? Truth, Lord. What'd she say? You're right, I am a dog. She wasn't upset about it. She already knew it. She said, I don't deserve to even be talking to you. She said, I don't deserve your attention. Don't deserve any merit. But you know what she believed? She believed that God was so good that even those that don't deserve it sometimes get blessed. She said, even the crumbs fall from the master's table. She said, the dogs can get them, Lord. She not only believed that God could help her, she believed that she wasn't worthy of it. I honestly believe that if she came and was turned away, she wouldn't have held it against God. That's great faith. Never does she rebuke, never does she, you know, rear up and say, well, Lord, you don't know who I am. He knew exactly who she was. He knew her before she was formed in the belly. All he was saying is, is I came for the Jews, but he came into his own, and his own received him not. Well, who did he give power to become the sons of God? Those that would believe on him. Use that faith. But what's this Syrophoenician woman? What she got? All she's got is faith. But she comes and she says, Lord, I know I'm not worthy. No, I don't deserve it. I know that I'm not even the one that you're here to talk, you know, come and preach to. She says, but I do know that you can help me. You're everything that I need. But I also know I don't deserve it. But Lord, I believe that you're just so good that you can't help even be good on accident to some of them that don't deserve it. What was the comment that Jesus said? That he hadn't found faith like that in all of Israel. Did he comment on her reasoning? Nope. Did he comment on the effort that it took her? No, he commented on her faith. Again, it was her faith that made the difference. Because faith will turn your seeking into diligent seeking. She got there and she was told no and she said, I understand that. But I'm not asking for the choice blessing. She said, I just want a leftover. She sought out and even after no, she said, but I don't want the best. I just want the scraps. Well, what she get as a result? The best. She said, I'm not asking for what I don't deserve. She's saying, don't. This over here, I know I can't have that. I'm just asking for, you know, the leftovers of the leftovers. She says, if you could just, you know, not sweep up after dinner and let me into the, I'll lick up everything that's left over. What faith? How many of us here know and then we just walk out the door? We say, well, God doesn't want me to do that. Well, that may not be the case. God may not want you to do that that way. There is 
three answers you can get from God. There's yes, no, and not now. But how many times do we hear no and we don't stick around long enough to hear not now or not that way or not yet? We just hear N-O and then we're gone. Get stubbed up on God. Don't show up for two weeks. But he's like, this woman, under the day, Jesus came about as close as he could to cursing her without cursing her. He called her dog. That offended her flesh. That was a derogatory. That'd be like when Samson called his wife a heifer. That same thing. It was meant to be offensive. That was it crude? Was it what's the word I'm looking for here? Right? Was it inappropriate? No. Wasn't a word you said all the time, but it's like I can say that somebody is a bastard and not a son. What's that mean? They don't have a legitimate father. Doesn't mean I'm cursing them. Right? Well, who was this? this woman was a dog. She's a mutt. Had no claim to anything. Jesus looked at her and said, Why would I give the best to you? And she says, Lord, I don't want the best. No, I don't deserve the best. She says, I'm just asking, can I hang around long enough for a crumb to fall my way? He said, Lord, I don't deserve the best, not asking for the best. She sought even after she heard no, because she wasn't looking for the best. He says, Not me. Take children meat, cast it to the dogs. He says, that's not right. He says, I'm here for the Jews. She says, I understand that. Can I just hang around? Eventually, somebody's going to drop something or there's going to be a crumb fall my way. I'm just asking hang around long enough that goodness can find its way to me. Why? Because she believed if she got close enough to God, what was going to happen? Goodness and mercy is going to be around them. She's just going to find some of it. Right, that if she got close to God, God couldn't help but just bless her. She wasn't listening for, but well, here's the meal. She never expected the meal. So when Jesus said, you can't have the meat, she said, I don't want the meat. I just want the crumbs. Sometimes, well, you know, you can't have, but Lord, I don't want that. I just want to get closer to you get some crumbs. Don't need that. Don't desire that. I just want you. Really, that's what she's saying. She's saying, I don't want all the blessings that you're you know, heaping out to all these people. She's saying, I just want to hang around long enough to get some of you. Her faith was diligent. Diligent enough to conquer the rejection in the flesh, to find acceptance through her faith well go back to verse number 6 we left out one part for he that cometh to God you know what that's talking about it's talking about they're diligently seeking they sought so diligently that they came to where God was Look with me again. But so without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Because they diligently sought, they got to where God was. And why did they go there? Because they believed that he was a rewarder of them that seek him out enough to find out where he is. Well, where is he? Well, he's everywhere. He's omnipresent. But there's a spot that he wants to meet with you at. I mean, go study it out. Normally, they'd set up altars at them places where God met with them. There's a place that they knew that they could go back to. God had met with them there before. It was a testament of the fact that God heard what had gone on at that place. Or they would name those places. So that everybody would know, from here on out, we're calling it this. Why? Because, well, 
all them hills that you go and study it at, study out, most of them were Jehovah something, because God did something on that mountain, and they named it after what God did on that mountain. God heard, or God spoke, or God did something. Why'd they do that? To commemorate them places. But let's be honest. Other than the altar there in Jerusalem that they had at the temple, how often do you find that God met at the same place with the same person in a short period of time? No, they were always moving to the next place that God wanted to meet them at. Look at all the wells that Abraham dug and Isaac ended up redigging. You know why they had so many wells? Because they was always moving around. They needed more water where, the, where they went next. He said, what's the point? Well, those that come to God are going to find out that God wants them to keep going. Well, when you get to where God wants you to be, you want to know how to be rewarded, you still got to diligently seek. Just because you got to where He was today doesn't mean that He's going to be there tomorrow. In fact, His ways change not. You know what God's way has always been? Progress. Not resting on your laurels. Not hoping that if you just stay where God was that He's going to be there again. Now I know God's got something else to do or else He'd take me out of this earth. I know that spiritually there's a place i got to get to today in order to meet with Him. But you know what I believe? I believe that if I diligently seek, I will find. And when I find Him, He'll reward the diligent faith. Because if I didn't believe all those things, what's the point in even trying? If I didn't believe that it was going to be worth the effort, why even do it? Those that come to God. Final requirement. You just got to get to where He's at. Then what? Ask Him where He's going to be tomorrow and get there. When you wake up, well, Lord, which way are we heading to find you today? Lord, I know you're in here, but where do you want to lead me from in here to get to where you are out there? Where you'd have me be in the world where you'd have me be spiritually where you'd have me be emotionally Lord I believe that when we get there there's going to be a reward for it well it may not be the meal that the world thinks you know, the world wants you know the bed of roses sunshine all the time I'm not looking for that Lord I'm just looking for enough today to get me to tomorrow because tomorrow I know you're going to take care of my needs over there too Lord I'm just looking for what you'd have for me today I don't want all of it now. I know you've got it all planned out. No, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I've got enough faith to get me where I need to be today. Why? So that it will be rewarded and I'll have enough faith tomorrow to get me where I need to be tomorrow. The great secret to faith is not that you have to believe all these great things. That you believe better than anybody else. No, it's either you believe enough to get you to where God is, or you don't believe enough to get you where God is. If you believe enough, you'll diligently seek Him out. And you'll get to where He's at. And guess what? He'll be a rewarder to you because you diligently sought after Him. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.